Welcome. Thank you all for uh, skipping lunch if you're here. Um, welcome to my talk on attacking network infrastructure. Um, my name's Luke. Uh, here's some point info about me. Uh, I'm a security enge engineer originally from Minnesota. I'm working in the Bay Area currently. Um, I'm a junior undergraduate student. Uh, it's my second year at DEF CON. Uh, I spoke last year. Um, I, I also participate in a lot of bug bounties. So if any companies run a bug bounty, you've probably heard my name. I, the jerk that submits bugs at anything other than working hours. Um, if you have any questions about this presentation uh, or you'd like to send me legal threats, there's my contact information. I'll put it back up at the end along with uh, the code and the slides for this presentation will be linked at the end. Louder, okay, better. I'm trying to avoid tipping it over. All right, uh, let's get the boring stuff out of the way first. Um, here's my lovely disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the author and don't necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any current or previous or future employer. Uh, just don't sue me. All right. Um, as usual, we'll start with a quick rundown of what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, what Internet2 is, uh, then move into some of their products, mapping their network, and then exploiting some of those products um, in order to gain control of uh, devices that are running on very large network uplinks. Now, to make this presentation work, there are two computers and four VMs up here that all have to work together perfectly, um, and there's only so many sacrifices you can make to the demo gods, so please bear with me if things don't work well. Um, I've tested them enough, but yeah, without further ado, let's get started. Um, so I wanted to give a bit of backstory uh, about how I got started looking at this software um, and this Perfsonar product, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, the university I attend has a nice website full of information about what applications and services are available to me as a student. Um, when I'm bored, I like to browse around and see, <coughs> excuse me, what I'm able to access. It's kind of amazing what an EDU email address grants you these days. Um, one of these pages was called uh, Internet2. So the description is, the internet is a global system of interconnected networks. The university connects to both the global internet and a number of special research and education networks commonly referred to as Internet2. These research provide high bandwidth connectivity, enabling and supporting research collaborations, educational opportunities regionally, nationally, and around the world. Basically, it's a um, private fiber network run between universities. It's used for sharing all sorts of research data that you know, would take a very long time to transfer over the standard uh, internet. Um, if you go to their website, you find an even more boring description about how Internet2 is a community of reader, uh, research and leaders and academia. And, um, Basically, it's just a consortium of universities. Uh, there are some corporations and some government agencies, but it's mainly universities connected to this, and it's mainly used for sharing research. Um, but one of the other things they do is they generate, or they create software for all of the people in this consortium. So um, they share the software between all of the companies and universities that participate, and in doing so, they also share vulnerabilities between each other, since they're all running the same software. Um, they also do collective bargaining on everything from AWS to Splunk to VMware. Um, basically, it's there to benefit all of the companies that participate. The other thing that it is is a private network. So this is what I was talking about. This is a map of their actual dark fiber. Um, it totals about 8.8 .8 terabits a second of optical capacity and about 100 gigabits a second of Ethernet capacity. Um, again, it was mainly developed for sharing research and technologies between universities. Um, now I get really excited when I see something like this because it's not just a whole bunch of blinking lights, but you know these are additional routing paths between each of the nodes on this network. And Internet 2 has been around since 1997, and a lot of people didn't really care about security back then. And so there's a whole lot of risk here where you know these routing paths might be trusted uh, or might be um, not even considered by some security teams because they've been around for so long. So in addition to the actual network, like I said, they produce a variety of products. Um, actually, most of these products are open source, which is really nice. They're, uh, um, the most popular one they have is called Shibboleth. Uh, it's essentially, it's a federated identity management uh, system. Essentially, it's a really nice SAML provider. It's really extensible. Um, if you've ever done any penetration testing on pretty much anything running at a US-based university, it likely interacted with Shibboleth for authentication. Um, but, Shibboleth is their most popular product. It's been poked at by some other people before, so I wanted to look at some of their other stuff. Uh, they have a lot of uh, tools in the performance and analytics category, so because they run these fiber networks, they need to maintain the health 
uh, of these networks. And so they do that through a tool called bandwidth control, which is essentially a wrapper around iPerf. It does a lot of the hard work in setting up a receiver and a sender on either end. Um, NDT is a diagnostics tool. Uh, OAMP is one-way ping. Um, and then Perf Sonar is a wrapper around all of those tools. And it's essentially an ISO you download. Um, and you can install it on one of your servers. And it makes scheduling bandwidth control tests and OAMP tests really easy. Um, we'll look at what it actually looks like in a minute. Um, first off, I just explained what Perf Sonar is. Um, for to give a, a closer example, if we are here in Las Vegas, if you look at the Las Vegas node, and the network operator in Las Vegas wanted to make sure that their fiber connection to Salt Lake City is remaining solid, um, they would set up a Perf Sonar instance in Las Vegas and a Perf Sonar instance uh, at Salt Lake City. And um, because they're all part of the same network, uh, they collaborate. And basically, you'll set up tests to run, say, every 24 hours, and it'll alert you if the network goes down or if uh, performance starts degrading. All right. So I'm going to actually look. I have two uh, instances set up here, two perf sonar instances. Uh, they're called Impact and Torpedo for easier things here. So you can see they're on the same network. Woo. Um, and so I'm going to run a quick bandwidth control test here. Uh, so this is just showing how some of their tooling works. And so what it's done here is it's chosen to use iPerf. Um, it can, you can customize this. You could say, I want to use ThruLay, or I want to use iPerf 2 or 3. Um, and then it schedules a test between the two. Because the way iPerf works, you need uh, both ends to agree on when uh, to set up a receiver and what ports to use. And then once that time goes, we have our info here. So we can see it got about a gigabit a second, which makes sense, since both of these hosts are running on gigabit connections. All right. Um, now let's look at the actual uh, toolkit website. So this is the, if it loads, this is the actual Perf Sonar interface. So this is what their uh, web uh, interface looks like. So it's essentially just a GUI for that tool I just used. So you can see here, uh, I've set up a test to run every half an hour between Impact and Torpedo, and we can see there's the last time the throughput was 600 megabits a second. Um, I can pull up and look at a graph of how that's changed over time. Now, since this is a virtual machine, there's big gaps here, but you know, it's easy for a network administrator to look at this and kind of see what's happening on their network. All right, back to the actual presentation. So one of the things I like to do when I'm first approaching a product is, uh, when I'm looking for issues, is look at what mistakes have already been made in the past. So developers tend to make the same mistakes over and over again. Um, you know, it's just how it is right now in the industry. And so uh, I went through, Personar used to be hosted on Google Code. Um, their website is back up. It was down um, because of the whole Google Code being deprecated. Uh, so issue 783 was found. And basically, it's a vulnerability in the web interface that I just showed you. Uh, it was patched in 2013. Um, and this is the patch for the issue. Um, so if you look at what this is, it's pulling in uh, Perl's libxml library, and it's adding an external entity handler um, that just always returns an empty string. So we're going to look at what, a, uh, what an external entity is and then how to exploit them in the real world. So if we start with a simple XML file, hopefully everyone can see this, we have a list of all the presentations I've given. So we have the name, the location, and then the author. And the author is always going to be the same every time. It's always going to be Luke Young. XML has this feature where you can define an entity. So I've defined an entity called LY with the value Luke Young. And then I can just reference this entity with an ampersand, the name of the entity, and a semicolon. That way, if I ever changed my name, if I got married, um, I can just edit it here, and it will edit, it'll update throughout the rest of the uh, XML document. And most XML parsers support this by default. So when you go to get the value within Python or whatever you're using, it will just return Luke Young. It happens transparently. The most, or one of the most popular attacks with this was something called the billion laws attack. Um, so basically, it's a denial of service issue. So you start with a single entity. You define an entity that includes that one 10 times, define another one that includes that entity 10 times, and you get um, an exponential growth here in memory when a XML parser tries to uh, unserialize this uh, XML. 
And for the most part, this actually here expands to something like 16 gigabytes of memory uh, and will actually crash most applications that have XML entities enabled. Um, but denial of service phones in this context are kind of lame. Just crashing this software is boring. It's not something we're looking for. Um, so the more interesting feature of XML is something called external entities. So you can define a system entity uh, with a file URL. And basically what this will do is it will actually load the contents of that file and inject it into the XML. So in this case, I'm gonna load in Etsy password and fill it in right here. Uh, this was originally intended for people that have multiple XML files and they can actually include other XML files within that. Um, that way you just load in one and it magically pulls in all the rest of the files but you can have a nice folder structure where you don't have to um, have everything in a giant XML file. However, there's obviously a lot of potential for abuse here um, because you could actually include a uh, file from the system. So, back to the actual issue. Um, the patch for this issue was to make whenever loading an external entity, it will return an empty string. Uh, that will not prevent the denial of service issue we just referenced, but anytime we try to do something like load a file URL, that will fail. So, First thing I'm just gonna do, I'm gonna take, uh, I've actually r-synced the uh, file system off one of these devices, and I'm going to just search for libxml new without an external entity handler defined. So we're looking to see if they missed anything, or if someone added new endpoints where they forgot to add this patch. And if we run it, right here, we've immediately got off the bat 13 matches of potential ways to get into this application using external entity ent entities. Um, now this is actually a bit of a false positive because some of these are libraries um, that are all symlinked and so Sublime thinks they're different files but there's actually only about six different ones here. The particular one that's vulnerable is in uh, NMWG message. So as you can see here, it defines a libxml handler. It doesn't set up a way to block external entities and then it parses in a file. And if we trace this all the way back up the stack, um, this is accessible as an external user. So that request looks a little bit like this. So we're gonna send a SOAP request. Um, any of you have done stuff with XML, you probably know what SOAP is. Um, and then we'll define this NMWG message handler and then within here we're gonna include Etsy password. So this file right here, we're actually gonna try and do this live now. Um, so we're gonna send a post request to the OPPD daemon on this server which traces all the way back to that Perl file. And if we run it, there's Etsy password off one of the systems. <coughs> So, next thing I wanna do, the authentication in this application is handled by Etsy Shadow, so I'm just gonna read Etsy Shadow instead. Um, this is a file I didn't show, it's just the exact same thing, except for Etsy Shadow, and it doesn't work. So the reason this happens here, uh, it actually just sends us an extremely verbose error message that it can't read that file. And so the reason that's happening is because the OPPD daemon isn't running as root on this device. So we don't have permission to read this file, and we actually, we can read other stuff off the system. For example, uh, we can read a SQL, um, somewhere in here, SQL passwords off the system. We can read configuration files. Um, however, none of it was really exploitable, actually. So while we can read arbitrary files, because authentication is handled uh, by Etsy Shadow, we couldn't get admin users, we couldn't get anything interesting. The SQL database is blocked off, so it's only accessible by localhost. And so I hit a like complete dead end here. So if we go back to the presentation, the, uh, the point I was at here was I was able to find cross-site scripting kind of everywhere, um, but cross-site scripting volumes are kind of lame. You have to get an admin to click a link while they're logged in and no one logs into these devices that often. Um, and it seemed there was a lot of XXE. As you saw, there were other issues there. However, getting RCE just seemed like an impossible task. I actually put it down for like a month and finally came back to it later. Um, and I found something called bandwidthgraph.cgi. So when I pulled up that graph a second ago, uh, that was bandwidthgraph.cgi. So this, this endpoint handles graphing historical bandwidth data of tests. And if we actually look at the data and the source code for this, we can see something interesting. So there's a eval call on an attribute from the XML data that is sent in here. 
And if we trace this all the way back up, we're gonna get into exploiting it now. Let's take a look at here, let me show. Here's some example performance data. You can see it's basically iperf results with a timestamp and the throughput value. And if you look at the throughput value, it's a scientific notation number. And parsing scientific notation in Perl is like five lines, and parsing it with eval is one. And so a developer was being lazy, and they decided to use eval, thinking that it was perfectly safe. Um, so we can see why he made this mistake, though. You know, uh, you're in a rush. It happens. So let's actually look at how to reach this code path because it's quite complicated. Uh, so starting at the top of bandwidthgraph.cgi, uh, we need a couple parameters. We need a URL parameter, which is the measurement archive. So uh, this measurement archive contains all of the data of tests that have been running over time. And so we need a URL to access that from, because you can run this in a cluster environment. And we need a key to look it up by. So if a test has a name, it has a key. So assuming we have both of those, we get all the way down into this get data function, which goes and looks, sets up a data request, makes a request to the measurement archive, and then pulls out this datum uh, XML attribute. Long story short, gets all the way down to throughput. There's actually a second step in here too, though. So the way the measurement archive works is when it makes a request, it first sends an echo request. And we have to echo that back with a success message before it will request the data. And so the reason that handshake is there is to avoid uh, actually kind of an attack scenario here where you're pointing it at a, uh, an attacker control system. However, uh, since we have complete access to the source code and this is open source, we're able to actually generate that correct echo request back. Uh, so this is what a example echo request looks like. Uh, this gets sent in. And the important part here is the event type here. As long as this value has that string, uh, it'll be accepted by the server. And then following that, we will, so this is, uh, we'll send back our actual exploit string. So if we look in the throughput parameter here, we put backtick, who am I, backtick. Because it's, uh, it's executing Perl. In Perl, you can put backticks and it'll drop to a shell. So here's our example exploit. Now I actually have a script to do that. And all of these scripts will be available, actually are available right now, um, if you have the link. All right, so we have a simple server here. It's gonna handle all of the magic of sending an echo request and then sending the exploit string. And if we actually pull up bandwidthgraph.cgi, and you can see we provided the key parameter, in this case, doesn't matter what it is because we control the server, and then the URL to access our uh, server app. And we don't see anything interesting here on the page, but if we actually look at the source code, we can see right here in the source code, it's printed out the results of who am I. So taking that a step further, um, we can put a full, uh, this is a, just a Python PTY uh, callback, so we can actually get an actual shell on this device instead of having to run commands one at a time. We refresh the page and we have a full shell now. All right, so you can see we're running as Apache. So same thing here, we want a cat, Etsy Shadow, and it doesn't work again. So we're kind of stuck. Having regular RC, fun, but we want root RC. So, back to the presentation. We're gonna talk about now how we obtain root on this device. So if we actually pull up the uh, Perfsonar toolkit interface, it has the ability to change configuration settings. You can turn on and off services, uh, such as bandwidth control and OAMP, and then you can change configurations for those. So you can change the default port, or you could change what restrictions there are. For example, you could change your bandwidth control to only accept TCP or only accept UDP uh, performance tests. And in order to start and stop services on Linux, you need root, um, unless you've made special changes. So somehow the application is obtaining root in order to do this. But if we go back to our shell, we don't have pseudo privileges, and there's no really easy way to find root there um, off of any file permissions or anything else. So if we actually look at, in the source code again, all the way down, they have a daemon running as root called uh, toolkit config. And it's a simple XML RPC server. It's only running on loopback, um, and it exposes five methods. It exposes a config firewall method, which accepts no parameters, so not anything exploitable there. 
It exposes a write file, start, stop, and restart service. So write file looks really interesting. Uh, ideally, we just write a new file, a new cron job as root, and now we have escalation. And so uh, here's the example code to do that. We say load in the config client, set it up to point to the loopback interface, and then call the save file method, which is an alias of write file. I don't know why they changed the method name in different parts of the application. Uh, and if we try to actually run this, it doesn't work. Uh, we have another issue here too, and so if we look at the source code, there's actually a white list of what files you're allowed to edit. Uh, so they put a little thought into this and you know, decided we shouldn't let someone write arbitrary files as root, that's a bad idea. So they built this whitelist. Here are all of the files in the whitelist. Uh, it's a rather extensive list because this is an extremely customizable application. You can install uh, other packages and so basically any config file that ever want to be edited as part of this application is in this list. And there's a couple of interesting ones in here. There's Etsy hosts. So we have the ability to redirect network traffic. Um, there's Etsy NTP, uh, so if we have any cert issues, we can you know, change the time on the host, along with uh, a bunch of Perfsonar software. So bandwidth control, OAMP, NDT, and we can edit all of those. We can also write HTML files, um, since we're Apache, so we could drop a cross-site scripting payload, but again, not very interesting. We want root on this devi device. So if we look at the bandwidth control uh, configuration, this is uh, an excerpt from it. It's got a user and a group, so it drops privileges immediately after running, and then a post hook parameter at the bottom. And so what this is, it's similar to a git hook. Uh, what happens is after a successful bandwidth control test, it executes the post hook. And so since we can edit this config manager, we can change the user and group so that the application never drops privileges, it's running as root, and then we point it to a post hook controlled by our Apache user. That way, when we trigger a successful test, it's going to trigger our post hook parameter as root. So in order to actually do that, it's a little more complicated. Um, we don't want to let the network administrator notice that something's broken. So we have to do this as quickly as possible and then restore it back to its original configuration uh, as quickly as possible. So we're gonna back up the original config, stop bandwidth control, write our post hook, write the new bandwidth control config, start bandwidth control, trigger a session, which has to be successful, which will trigger our post hook, stop bandwidth control, remove our post hook, so we delete our evidence, and restore the original bandwidth control config, and then start it back up again. So, I'm gonna actually try to do that now. So we have our shell, we're currently logged in as Apache. Uh, I'm gonna pull down shell.pm, uh, which is a, uh, <laughs> A script I've written, and we're gonna run it. So that's actually gonna take about 60 seconds to run. So we're gonna look at what this is doing here. It's pulling in, again, the config client. We're loading in, I don't know why this has to be here. I don't write Perl scripts, but it crashes if it's not. Um, and here is the post hook we're actually writing. So we're gonna copy bin bash to a different value, and then we're gonna set UID on that binary so that whenever we run it, we can become root. And then the rest of this is doing all of that work of restoring the original config. Here's our exploit config with the post hook parameter inside of it. So if we actually go back to the shell, hopefully. Ooh. <laughs> this is why you don't do live demos. Let's try that again. Nope. Oh, we are root. Okay, <laughs> it did work. <laughs> awesome. Now, uh, that's fun. We have root on these devices. Who cares? Is anyone actually even running these things? So, you know, I happen to stumble across this. It's an obscure application. Are these running anywhere in the wild was my next step. So, next goal is to try to find out where these are running. I don't have an ISP that plays nice with mass scanning the entire IPv4 internet space, so I had to find a nicer way to locate these devices. So if you actually look at a example, um, here's a, you know, a live instance of one of these running, we can see there's all sorts of information here. There is, this is unauthenticated. You can view all of this. You don't need any creds. You can see what services are running, what ports they're running on, and more importantly, you can see the interfaces on the right there. 
So you can see information about uh, if they're connected, if they're dual homed and they have, are connected to an internal private network. You can see the MAC address of the devices and you can actually see the speed of the card according to ETH tool. So we can tell if there's a 10 gigabit card inside of each device without even authenticating. The other thing we have here at the bottom is test results. So you can actually see what application or what other hosts each of these uh, instances is testing against. So the idea is we start with one of these nodes, we ask it who they're testing against, and then we ask each of those nodes who they're testing against, and we map the entire network that way. But we still need some starting nodes. And so if only there was a nice public database of all of these devices. Oh, wait, if you look in the corner up here, there's globally registered, which is uh, pretty much exactly what you think it is. Uh, they provide a actual database on their site of all of the globally registered perf, perf sonar servers. Also unauthenticated. It even has a pretty web interface. So here's the idea. We start with the public list because there are still unlisted instances and we map the network from there on. So you can see the grayed out ones represent ones that aren't publicly registered, but we can locate them through the other ones. All right. So doing that, I actually wrote a, it's about a 300 line Golang script um, that does this exactly what I've just described. It starts, it pulls down the list of all the publicly, um, publicly registered instances, maps them all, asks them who they're testing with, maps all of them, and it pulls down the interface data from each of those. It takes about four minutes to map the entire network from my gigabit connection. Uh, that could probably be improved. It's not actually saturating that. Um, my code kind of sucks, but it's open source. Someone else can fix it. Um, <laughs> so what I actually do is kind of take all of this data and load it into Splunk. So uh, Splunk didn't sponsor me or anything, I just like Splunk. Using all of that, as of April 29th, when I mapped the network, there were 970 publicly routable nodes uh, combined to 12.51 terabytes of RAM across all of them and 29.85 terahertz of CPU cycles across all these devices. Uh, it's easier to understand terms, the average node has 13 gigabytes of RAM and 12 cores at 2.6 gigahertz. All right, so. Next we wanna look at what the theoretical network speed of this device is. So each of the included in that data is the uh, information about the network card on the box. So I can tell if it's a 10 gig or a 20 gig or a 40 gig network card. So if we do all of that and sum all of those together, we get the theoretical bandwidth of the perf sonar network, which is 5.719 terabits a second. Now, Theoretical speeds are kind of lame, and I really wanted to know what this was actually capable of. Because you may have a 10 gig card and only a 5 gig uplink, and I can't find any way to tell that without exploiting your server, which I like not going to jail. Um, however, I had an idea here. So I have a gigabit connection at home. I can run bandwidth tests from my server to one of the Perfsonar instances and find out information about their uh, bandwidth but that has an upper bound. I can only find out up to a gigabit a second since I only have a gigabit uplink. I'm not about to go pay for a 40 gig uplink in order to test these vulnerabilities, so I had to find some other way. Turns out they have another friendly unauthenticated API where you can say run a bandwidth test against a different perf sonar node and send me the results. So the goal here is actually uh, enumerate all their perfs on our instances and their maximum interface speed, calculate their location based on GOIP, and then find the five closest instances uh, that have the same or faster network cards within them. And then after all of that's done, we want to run tests between them. And this sounds like some horrible messed up CS interview question. Uh, I can guarantee you I did not implement this very efficiently. Uh, there's the Splunk query that uh, does all of that. It works. <laughs> it takes like an hour to run, but it does return results. So once we have all of that data, we actually want to run these tests. And we have to be careful here when we're running these tests because we actually have the, uh, the risk here of generating a denial of service when running these tests. Um, so we have to be careful. We only want to run two tests at the same time ever. Um, 
We never want to run or more than 10 at the same time ever, and we never want to run uh, two tests on the same instance. So if you have a 10 gig uplink, but I run two 10 gig tests against you, they're both going to get like five gigs, which is inaccurate. I want to only run one at a time. And then some hosts don't have bandwidth control enabled. So while I know they're exploitable, I can't find out what their bandwidth is. So we're actually losing out on some data here about hosts that if we were exploiting this for real, we would have been able to attack, but we can't because they don't have bandwidth control enabled. So doing all of that, uh, which takes a very long time to run, um, I was able to calculate uh, the actual demonstrated total bandwidth of the perf sonar network, uh, which is 3.7 terabits a second. Um, now in the title of the talk, I mentioned four terabits. I didn't just round. Uh, I did account for all of those instances that don't have bandwidth control enabled, but we know that they are sitting on at least a 100 megabit uplink. And that combine that all together, you get to four terabits a second. Now the fact that I'm calling it, uh, um, so the, ah, excuse me. Um, so if you've, uh, any of you were around last, Two years ago now, um, Cloudflare blocked an attack in Europe against Spam House. Uh, it was a 300 gigabit a second attack, um, and they had an interesting effect they were seeing where, where some of their network could handle the, uh, the traffic, their upstream ISP peers were actually falling over. Um, and that's one of the risks here when you have that much bandwidth. And that was 300 gigabits a second, given that was two years ago, uh, this is four terabits a second. And we have complete control of the packets being sent. Because we are root on this device, this isn't something like DNS amplification where, you know, if you have the right firewall rule, you can block that traffic. This is, you know, I could send you four terabits a second of legitimate HTTP requests. Assuming the network cards can push that out, you know, it's really hard to filter something like that because it could be legitimate traffic. Um, given uh, there are actually some interesting ways to defend against stuff like this. All right, so on to the live demo. Hopefully, we're gonna take down a site here, not someone else's site, again. So the initial version of this uh, talk, I, uh, I have a couple perf sonar instances running at home, and I was planning on attacking a server co-located in the data center and I launched the attack while doing rehearsals and my phone blew up because I crashed the network at the house and there were about 18 dudes pissed off at me that their internet didn't work and about 10 minutes later I got a letter from the ISP saying, please stop doing that. <laughs> so we're gonna cheat a little and we're gonna, we're gonna attack some VMs here. Um, so we have a, a simple server, HTTP server, running on Poncho here. Um, I'm going to download a simple DDoS script, and hopefully, it's really hard to see, but that is just sitting there spinning right now. So, ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> So on to the uh, last part. Um, so I reported all these issues to Perf Sonar. Um, sorry to disappoint you, you can't actually go exploit these right now, though I would highly encourage people to continue looking at this software. It is a legacy Perl application. I don't think I found everything by any means. Um, I kind of stopped once I had a full chain all the way to root. Um, and it, it, it is interesting and they are very responsive. So this was one of the pull requests since it's all open source. I just fixed the issues myself, um, and the team was extremely friendly. They fixed the issues, merged my request within 24 hours, and pushed out a new build uh, pretty, mu pretty much immediately. And the great part is all, these all of these instances have auto updates enabled, so pretty much everyone on the network is upgraded at this point. That was about a month ago uh, that build got pushed out, so when you do find security issues, they typically are patched very quickly by them, so that's great. Um, was very happy with the response time by them. And then uh, finishing this up, all of the exploit code has been released on my GitHub uh, along with the slides. Um, you could also go to that URL, board.engineer has, uh, has links to it right there if you don't want to remember that. 
Um, as promised, here's my contact info again. Uh, we got out a little early this time, so you have some time to make it to your next talk. Uh, if people have questions, feel free to... Uh, That was a really good question. He asked what I spent $5 on. I put it in the talk title. I, I could repeat the question. The question was, what did you spend $5 on? That's a very good question. It's in the talk title. Again, in the initial version of this application, I was going to spawn up a VPS instance for $5 and then launch an attack live across the internet. And then, of course, my ISP got very angry about that. So I did not update the title, unfortunately. That's what the $5 is from. How much total time spent? Total time spent uh, actually finding the exploits was probably like 10 hours. And then uh, writing reliable exploits for them was probably like six. And then mapping the network was a colossal pain since I'm not a stats person. And figuring out how to write those queries correctly sucks. So that, that was probably another like 10. 40 hours roughly total. Thank you all. Have a great DEF CON. Too bad. <laughs> Thanks.